good morning, everyone in the US, I guess, and uh, good afternoon for here in Europe. And it's my pleasure to introduce Jonas Suisse, who will be giving the seminar today. And just to introduce him a bit more in academic context, Jonas studied physics here in Germany in Constance, where he initially specialized in quantum optics, but he then became more interested in biophysics later on and uh, did his PhD in Dresden with Petra Schrille, where he developed uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy for the use on biological membranes. And after his PhD, he went uh, to do a postdoc at the ETH in Zurich with um, Helge Evers and Wahid Sandokta, where he started to actually work on super resolution microscopy, a technique that he's now broadly developing uh, further in his own lab at EMBL, where he became a group leader in 2012. And so today he will talk about uh, the multiple efforts that he's been doing on pushing super resolution microscopy towards, uh, I guess, really structural scales. And I hope he will also tell us a little bit about his recent findings and insights that he got into the structural organization of very complex protein machines. So with this, um, Jonas, the screen is yours and I'm looking forward to the presentation. Yeah, Robert, thank you so much for this very beautiful introduction and hello to everybody again. So um, my group here at the EMBL is interested in understanding how complex protein machines are organized inside the cells. And for this, we are developing new tools using super resolution microscopy. So I think these are at the moment very exciting times for um, structural biology and cell biology. It has been the resolution revolution in electron microscopy that now allows us to solve protein structures even inside cells. This is really truly fantastic. But still to reach such a high resolution, we still have to average over many identical structures, which is not always easy if you look at less regular and dynamic protein machines. And also, the yeah, electron microscopy, of course, cannot directly look at dynamics in the living cell. On the other hand, of course, we have fluorescence microscopy, which works very well in living cells. And it has the additional advantage that we have molecular specificity, because we know what protein we put our flow for on, we know exactly what we are looking at. But the problem has been the resolution limit of about 200 nanometers. But then a second resolution revolution happened, this time in the field of um, optical microscopy with the development of the so-called super resolution microscopy methods. And these methods now push the resolution of process microscopy towards the nanometer scale, towards structural scales. And in this, they really quite optimally complement the truly structural techniques because they have the molecular specificity, we know where the proteins are, and at least um, there's the prospect of having them work in the living cell. So my group, we are now trying to develop new technologies that allow us to directly see how complex and dynamic protein machines look like and also evolve in the living cell. And the method that we are using, um, you know already, it's single molecule localization microscopy, the same as PALM or STORM, and in media probably it's still PALM microscopy. Um, and just to remind you, for this technique, we have to label our uh, target proteins with a fluorophore that we can switch between a bright state and a dark state. Then we acquire tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of camera frames. In each camera frame, we switch on only a very small subset of fluorophores because then we can determine the precise positions. And then from these positions, slowly uh, reconstruct a super resolution image. So once we are done, and this takes some time, minutes to hours, then um, these super resolution images have a resolution which is one order of magnitude, in some cases even two orders of magnitude better than the normal diffraction limited resolution. So today I will start by telling you about an application of super resolution microscopy to endocytosis. And, in, and we start by talking about yeast. Then I will tell you a few technical developments with which we try to push super resolution microscopy towards structured scales and establish as, it as a useful and complementary technique for other structural techniques and structural cell biology. I come back to endocytosis, to the biology, and I will end by giving you a preview of, um, on a very new super resolution technique called MinFlux, for which I really have very high hopes because I think it can really revolutionize how we do structural cell biology. But let me start with endocytosis. So what is endocytosis? Endocytosis is the, um, the mechanism by which cells take up molecules from the surface and the environment. It's kind of how cells eat. Therefore, it's a very important process for any eukaryotic cell. Endocytosis is driven by a quite complex machinery in which more than 50 different proteins in many copies self-assemble 
and then within seconds pull in the membrane and pinch up a vesicle. But also endocytosis has been quite difficult to study because of this huge complexity, the fast dynamics, and the small size way below the resolution limit of optical microscopy. And as a result, we don't know nearly as much as we would like to where all of these different proteins are during the timeline of endocytosis. So we started investigating this, um, this uh, question using body yeast as a model system. And the reason is that on one hand, endocytosis has been shown to be highly regular, which is very useful for us, as you can see. And on the other hand, um, um, yeast cells make it very easy for us to label our target proteins with fluorophores with a process called homologous recombination. So we can easily label two, three, four different proteins at the same time, combine it with deletions and mutations of other proteins. That's something that's, of course, very powerful and also something that is still quite cumbersome to do using CRISPR-Cas in mammalian cells. So endocytosis is conserved from yeast to mammals, but there's one important difference, and that is that yeast cells have a cell wall and a high internal pressure, the turgor pressure. And this pressure pushes the membrane against the cell wall. As a result, we need a quite high force to put in the membrane against this uh, pressure. And we know that in yeast, this force is generated by the actin machinery, by polymerizing F-actin. But we don't really understand how this can be if you look at the numbers, because the required force is more than two orders of magnitude higher than the stall force of a single actin filament growing. So to address this question and to in general understand how the different proteins are organized in yeast endocytosis, we performed single molecule localization microscopy in a very simple form, just in 2D. And by focusing on the bottom pole of the yeast cells, we get therefore projections along the axis of invagination. So top views on the endocytic structures. So here you see a single um, image of a single endocytic site that shows one of the proteins, um, a wasp homolog class 17. And you see that this protein forms this ring-like structure during endocytosis. Now, here you see the same protein imaged in many different endocytic sites. And what you see is that these proteins don't always look exactly the same. There's quite a lot of heterogeneity. This is, of course, one hand due to the labeling, due to the um, imaging that we do with the blinking fluorophores that introduces a lot of variability, but also because of biological variability. And therefore, to make sense of all this data in a statistically meaningful way, um, we therefore have to look at many, many identical structures. And, um, and we estimate we have to look at thousands of structures per endocytic site. These are huge numbers, considering that localization microscopy is such a slow technique that it takes minutes to hours to acquire a single super resolution image from the tens of thousands of camera frames. So this project only became feasible because we completely automated the entire data acquisition and data analysis workflow and then have our microscopes run around the clock over many months. So this microscope then takes many regions of interest. Um, automatically, we segment the cells, segment the endocytic sites, and then analyze these endocytic sites automatically. And one of our preferred ways of doing it is to calculate the radial densities, the averages. For this, we determine the positions of the individual structures, shift them on top of each other, and then just average them. So here you see the result actually of a lot of work. These are the radial densities of 23 different proteins in yeast endocytosis, so about half of the proteins that are involved. You can um, notice that these proteins form really quite different, uh, different patterns. They are organized in different zones, but also that this organization is related to their function. So code proteins form patches of different sizes, actin-regulating proteins form rings, and actin interactive proteins something in between rings and patches. So this is very interesting. However, there's still one problem with these data, and that is that we had to use fixed cells. We couldn't synchronize our endocytic events, and therefore these are all averages over the entire endocytic timeline. So we don't have any time resolution. So how can we get time information back and still use fixed cells? Well, for this, we used so-called timing markers. And these are proteins that change their abundance during the endocytic process and that we image alongside our super resolution images. Because then we can just sort these images according to the signal of the, of the timing marker and therefore effectively sort these images according to time. From this, now we got a quite um, yeah, a lot of information about how the endocytic machinery is structurally organized in these cells and how it's assembling. 
but I don't want to um, or don't have time to really go into detail here, but I want to highlight one discovery that we made. And this is how the force is generated and transmitted on the membrane. So I told you that in yeast endocytosis, the force is generated by a polymerizing F actin network. For this to happen, new actin filaments have to branch off the old ones. And for this, we need an activated up to three complex. And this up to three complex is activated by a so-called WASP protein. We now formed, uh, found that the WASP homolog uh, forms strings at endocytic sites. These strings are established early on, long before the actin starts polymerizing. But once actin polymerizes, um, it can only grow close to the WASP because on here the up to three is activated. That means new actin can be only added below the old actin. This pushes up the entire actin structure. And since the actin is tethered to the membrane by another molecule, this just pulls in the membrane through the center of this ring. To further investigate this and to confirm if our, our hypothesis this makes sense, we teamed up um, with a physical biologists in the group of Francois Nedelec, who developed this beautiful simulation software, Cytosim, and we used the software to simulate the endocytic process in the computer. So here you see what the simulation shows us. You see the actin filaments growing till, um, till they get denser and denser, and enough pressure is generated to pull in the membrane that you see in green. So one key result of this simulation was that if we use realistic numbers for the required forces and number of molecules, indeed enough force is generated to pull in the membrane and against the high pressure. And the reason is, and as you can see, if you look closely, that the actin filaments don't grow perpendicular to the membrane where they would be stalled, but most of them grow in the membrane plane. Here they are free to grow. They don't experience any stall force, but they still need space. They're crosslinked to all the other actin filaments. And this then, Gen uh, generates the force to invaginate the membrane. So now we would really like to understand in detail how all these proteins come together to perform this complex task. So ideally, we would take a 50 color super resolution image or movie in the living cell with a um, single uh, millisecond temporal resolution. But as you can imagine, this is not really possible at the moment. So our pro approach is to instead use the high regularity of yeast endocytosis and to write, try to reconstruct the dynamics of this process from thousands of snapshots taken in fixed cells. For this, we take these high quality uh, dual color super resolution images. This time we focus on the, on the equator of the yeast cell. And by doing so, we go to get side view projections on the endocytic uh, sites and we rotated all these images so that the axis of invagination points upwards. So we then use fe uh, features in these images to sort them according to what we think is time, to pseudo time, and also to then integrate many individual images um, in, into one common coordinate system uh, and to integrate different data sets showing different uh, protein pairs again into such a composite data set. A nice way of showing such data is to run it as a movie. But I have to stress again, this is not a real movie. This is a dynamic reconstruction taken from a few hundred images take, uh, in fixed cells. But this reconstruction now runs in real time and it would be quite difficult at the moment to get a similar spatial or temporal resolution with any life cell super resolution technique, even in one color. So now we are at the process of adding more and more proteins to this dynamic reconstruction. And I think if we understand where the different proteins are during the endocytic time, um, we can learn, learn a lot about their function, especially if we combine it with perturbations, lesions or, to, uh, uh, or mutations of protein, and then monitor how this affects the structure and dynamics of the other proteins. So now I would like to change gears completely and talk about some technical developments that we did in the group to push super resolution microscopy towards structural scales. And I will start by um, one topic that is, I think, very important and that has been neglected too long, and that is quality control. And that's something that really has not been um, established for the field of localization microscopy, and that made it very difficult to decide if our microscopes are still as good as they were a year ago, or if they are as good as those in Julia, for example. Here you see two publicly available data sets showing the same structures, microtubules, um, imaged with basically the same technique, but these images don't look exactly the same. And the reason for this can be manifold. It can be because of the microscope, the imaging conditions, the labels that we use, the sample preparation protocol, or even software that we use for analysis. 
and to investigate all of these points and to optimize them, what we really would like to have is a sample that is the same every time we look at it and everywhere we look at it. And this is a standard sample. So therefore, we generated such a standard sample and our idea was to use nuclear pore complexes because here nature puts proteins at well-defined 3D positions in a defined stoichiometry. And we chose as a target protein, the protein NAP96, which forms two rings in the nuclear pore. Each of these rings has two times eight copies. And these um, two rings are in register so that in the top view, um, we could expect to see this nice eight port symmetry of the pore. We then generated um, homozygous CRISPR cell lines in which we labeled NAP96 with four commonly um, used labels for super resolution microscopy. And um, we made these cells in a way that we don't have any unlabeled protein present and also that we um, don't have any overexpression. So we labeled the proteins and the endogenous locus. So this is now how these uh, cell lines look uh, like in the different kinds of microscopy modalities that we had access to. So you see that in the diffraction limited techniques, we can resolve quite easily individual pores. But of course, we don't see any structures within the pores. Using the super resolution technique step microscopy, we can resolve these pores as these beautiful rings. And these rings are also visible in expansion microscopy. So to those who don't know this technique, expansion microscopy is the crazy technique where you don't increase the resolution of your microscope, but incre instead increase the size of your sample. And you do this by embedding it in a gel and then swelling the gel. And then even with the standard microscope, you can res resolve structures smaller than the resolution limit. And it really works. So if you use localization microscopy using photoconvertible proteins, which are not too bright, we also, of course, see these rings, but we already start to see this eight-fold symmetry. And this eight-fold symmetry is very easily visible if you use brighter organic dyes for localization microscopy. So now we can ask questions such as, can we resolve these two rings in Z? Then we know we have a Z resolution of better than 50 nanometers. So, but in addition of testing the performance of our microscopes, these nuclear pores also turned out to be very important for us to optimize all aspects of the um, data, um, of the sample preparation, data acquisition, and data analysis workflows. And the reason is that these cell lines uh, or these samples are quite um, reproducible to prepare. And that in a single uh, slice, in a single image, we can have thousands of nuclear pores in focus at the same time. And this gives us a huge um, statistical accuracy and allows us to even see minor changes in the image quality because we change a parameter only uh, slightly. Also importantly, these nuclear pores allow us to determine the labeling efficiency of our fluorophores. And that's something that otherwise is not so easy to, to, to determine. So how we do we do this? Well, you can realize that if you don't have 100% labeling, we won't see every single nuclear pore as a complete ring but corners start missing. Therefore, we then automatically segment hundreds of nuclear pores and then automatically count the number of visible corners in each nuclear pore complex. We then fit a probabilistic model to the distribution of this number of corners. We directly get from the fit the absolute labeling efficiencies and this with a, high, a quite high precision. So this is useful because it, uh, we, use it, we, we can use it to test the, um, test the labels that we use, in this case, the nanobodies that we made ourselves uh, in the group. So on the left-hand side, you see a good batch of nanobodies, which uh, leads to almost complete pores. In the middle, you see a bad batch of nanobodies. On the right-hand side, you see our good batch of nanobodies that unfortunately, after two years in the fridge, also went bad. And we now can put numbers to these nanobodies, how good or how bad they are. Finally, we found that these nuclear pore cell lines can be also quite useful for a biological application, and that is to count the number of proteins in an unknown complex. So counting in localization microscopy means to relate the number of localizations to the number of proteins. But these numbers are not exactly the same, because on one hand, we might have limited um, labeling of, the, of, the, of our proteins, which leads to undercounting. On the other hand, there's a tendency to see a flow four not only once, but several times. And this leads then to overcounting. Now, there's one approach that is insensitive to these artifacts, and this is counting with the help of a counting reference standard. And that's a complex of a known stoichiometry that we label with the same flow force as our unknown target and image under exactly identical conditions. Because then we can directly calculate the stoichiometry of the target complex from the relative number of localizations. 
So it turned out that our nuclear pore samples work actually quite well suited as such counting reference standards. And the reason is that they are quite easy to segment. So nuclear pores never overlap. So we would never mistake two nuclear pores as a single one. Also, um, they have this typical size and shape. So we would never mistake some background localizations as some real localizations. So we validated this counting by counting the number of NAP107 proteins per nuclear pore complex. That's another nuclear porin. And we hit the expected number of 32 really spot on. And when we repeated this experiment many times, we found that the standard deviation was less than 10%. And that's quite good for intracellular counting. But we don't even need to use super resolution microscopy to do counting with these cell lines. Because we can, um, can even in a normal confocal image, um, distinguish and resolve individual pores. And that allows us to, to calibrate um, um, or to determine what, um, what ray levels 32 GFPs correspond to. And therefore, deter to, to use this to calculate or to transform the gray scale images into absolute protein numbers. So we validate this, this again by again looking at NAP107. And again, you see that we had a high precision and a high accuracy with this counting approach. So to summarize, we generated these cell lines um, where we labeled NAP96 with commonly used super resolution microscopy labels and um, showed that they are quite useful to, to optimize the microscopy conditions, including the labeling efficiencies, and also to count the number of proteins. So these cell lines are now um, really shared with quite a lot of groups worldwide. And I think they're already now becoming the gold standard when it comes to quality control in super resolution microscopy. And you can easily get them, you know, outsource the distribution because um, it was a bit too much of work to do it ourselves, but you can just order these cell lines if you like. So of course, if you want to um, use super resolution microscopy for something like structural cell biology, it's important to have the highest possible resolution and that in all 3D, in all directions, in 3D. But if we, it, it, we fit our single fluorophores, we get from the fit first, first only the X and Y position, but no information about Z. And this, of course, is a problem because biology is intrinsically three-dimensional. To solve this, um, localization microscopy has been extended quite early to 3D. And the idea is to not only look at the position of the single fluorophores, but also at the shape of the single molecule images, these point spread functions. And this is usually done after introducing aberrations. In this case, um, astigmatism by inserting a cylindrical lens that focuses the light more strongly in one direction compared to the other direction leads to this elliptical point spread functions. By just looking at the aspect ratio of these ellipses, we can therefore quite, um, we can determine the Z position of the fluorophore. So these techniques are quite easy to implement, but at least at the beginning, they were, were not super precise. So the error in Z was always much larger than in X and Y. And one reason for this was that during the data analysis, we had to assume that the PSFs are described by Gaussian functions, but quite often realistic real PSFs you find in your microscopes are not Gaussian at all, especially if you defocus them. Therefore, we developed a um, fitting framework that allowed us to use experimentally calibrated and therefore much more precise models for fitting in localization microscopy. And this worked quite well. Now we can resolve these immunolabeled microtubules as these beautiful hollow cylinder-like structures in 3D. We get such a high resolution in a slice of a few hundred nanometers around the focus. Therefore, if you want to look at larger, thicker structures, for example, entire cells, we have to image them Z slice by Z slice. In each of these Z slices, we have a high 3D resolution, and then we just have to sort of stitch all these slices together. And this is what we did here. Again, um, you see microtubules. This is now a rotating view, and below here, you see a thin slice that uh, goes through the cell. And I think you can appreciate the 3D resolution that we have here that probably allows us to follow every microtubule through the cell. However, we obtained such a nice data only because of a breakthrough that we had in the lab. That is that we discovered one dye, CF60C, that was very photostable and could be switched on and off many, many times. So this is very important because if, whenever we acquire a single slice, then all the flu force and all the other slices get already switched on and off and therefore get bleached. So only with this dye, we could acquire many slices. With our standard dyes, we usually would lose all the fluorophores after acquiring a handful of slices instead. 
So we can have such a resolution, not only a single color, but at the moment up to four colors simultaneously. And what you see here is a single nuclear pore complex where we um, labeled four of its components. And above you see then um, an average um, calculated from about 200 of these nuclear pores. And um, how we do this is that we have only two detection channels and have four um, pirate dyes that we see in both of these detection channels. By just looking at the intensity ratios of individual fluorophores in these channels, we can then assign the color. So this is, I think, quite useful. But there's still one major limitation with this kind of 3D localization microscopy. And that is that the Z resolution is still always by a factor of two to three worse than the X and Y resolution in the best case. And also that the X and Y resolution is reduced because we had to introduce these aberrations to get a Z resolution in the first place. Therefore, we developed a conceptually very different approach to Z localization and localization microscopy that we call supercritical angle localization microscopy. So my idea was to use a near field effect for Z localization. By this effect, a fluorophore can couple its emission directly into the glass. This extra emission now very strongly depends on the distance of the fluorophore from the interface. And we can detect it separately from the standard emission by just putting an elliptical mirror in the beam path. And then by just uh, comparing the intensity of the fluorophore in these two channels, we can precisely determine the Z position. Nowadays, this really works quite well. And I want to show you um, how well it works on the example of such a synthetic nanostructure at DNA origami. So this is the theoretical design, these two squares or rings at a distance of 30 nanometers. This is how we could um, resolve it with our old 3D technique. And this is now how well we can resolve it with the supercritical angle localization microscopy with a resolution of really much better than 10 nanometers in all directions. If I now show you to scale the clustering triskelion, so this one unit of the clustering code during endocytosis, you can appreciate that we start approaching spatial scales that become relevant for structural biology. So such a high resolution, we can um, achieve at a relatively thin slice above the cover slip of a few hundred nanometers. And therefore, this method is especially useful if you want to look at membrane-related processes, for example, endocytosis. So another major limitation of localization microscopy, and I mentioned this already, has been the slow speed and the slow throughput. Because localization microscopy is really an annoyingly slow technique. It takes minutes to hours to acquire a single super resolution image from the tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of camera frames. And this is not ideal if we want to do high throughput localization microscopy. For example, if you want to find rare events or compare many different conditions, and it is even worse if you want to go to living cells where the speed of the process that we're interested in determines how fast we need to go. So what can we do? One solution I um, presented already to you, and this is to automate our microscopes and have them run around the clock over months. And this really can produce a huge, a huge amount of data. But it doesn't help us with lifestyle localization microscopy because it doesn't uh, speed up the image process itself. So to um, to obtain these images faster, these data faster. Something that people already tried before us and that we also tested was to acquire the camera frames that we need in a much shorter time. And for this, we bought faster cameras, used stronger lasers, and then used our nuclear pore complexes to um, systematically um, yeah, measure if the image quality depends on the imaging speed. Unfortunately, found, we found that there is a huge trade-off between image quality and image speed. So if you go very fast, as you see here, then we lose a lot of resolution, but we also lose the localizations themselves. We have a lot of bleaching before we can localize the flu force. On the other hand, if you go very slow, and this is much, much slower than we usually go, we could further increase the brightness of the flu force and thereby the, the localization precision and the resolution and with it, the image quality. So you see what we did here. We wanted to go faster, but we ended up going even slower than before. So this also is not the best way of increasing the speed in localization microscopy. So finally, we tested um, increasing the information content in each frame um, by 
by activating many more fluorophores in each frame, because this allows us then to acquire the same number of, uh, of localizations just using much less frames and therefore using shorter times. The problem is that if we have these high density localizations, that these, that the fluorophores start overlapping and the standard fitting approaches that we use have a very hard time to determine the positions of these fluorophores. As you see here in red, the fits completely fail. Of course, the community is developing new software that should deal with these cases, so-called multi-emitter fitting algorithms. But unfortunately, also these are not very robust at the moment, especially if you look at three-dimensional samples. Therefore, we teamed up um, with computational scientists and um, yeah, really wonderful um, researchers, Jakob Macke and um, Srini Turaga. Uh, Srini is in Genelia, and um, the, the fantastic PhD student, Arthur, from Jakob and Srini and my, uh, my master student, Lukas. And we develop a new software that we call Decode and that uses deep learning and neural networks to localize flow force under high density conditions in 3D. And our idea was that by being able to now um, increase the density of localizations, we can also increase the imaging speeds. So this whole turned out to work very well. And in a um, public software challenge that benchmarks and compares different localization across queer algorithms, this new software outperformed all other algorithms on all modalities, often by a large margin, as you see here. And this is now very useful because it allows us to increase the, the imaging speed in, in our case by a factor of 10. So this you see here, where we image the same region of interest um, under single emitter conditions and increasingly higher um, higher densities by just increasing the UV laser power we use for activation. And we always acquired the same number of localizations. And you see it if we go now more than 10 times faster, we do lose a little bit of resolution, but it's not massive, especially if compared uh, with one of the best um, standard emitters, which already has a multi-emitter cap capability, the so-called C-spline fitter from the uh, Shawi Zhuang lab. This is quite useful because it allow, allows us now to look at very highly labeled samples, samples that are so densely labeled that even without any UV activation, um, already too many fluorophores are in their bright state. Typically, we would have to do, use pre-bleaching for these samples and bleach the majority of the fluorophores to get to the single emitter regime. But then we end up again with these very sparse uh, de decorations, as you see here on the right hand side. But with decode, we can now image these samples from the beginning and get a much better decoration of these microtubules by the flow force. Therefore, we get much more information. But these high imaging speeds are especially useful if you go to living cells. Here you see um, these nuclear pore complexes, this time imaged in living cells within only three seconds. And another big advantage is that by activating so many more flow force per frame, we also reduce phototoxicity because we don't have to use higher imaging laser powers, but we acquire less frames to get the same number of localizations. Therefore, we reduce the light dose that the cell sees. With this, we can also look um, or take dynamic data. Here you see um, the endoplasmic reticulum and um, imaged um, over a time scale of a minute. And you see actually quite a lot of structural rearrangements happen here within seconds. So I want to end this kind of technical part by talking about data analysis. So we can, of course, um, now get these quite beautiful super resolution images. But often the question then is, what now? How can we extract meaningful measures from such data that then allows us to statistics and to drive um, the biological interpretation? And analysis approaches that can do this very well specifically for localization microscopy are still quite rare and are only now being developed. So in my group, we actually spent a lot of effort on uh, software tools for localization microscopy. And all these tools are now integrated into one software platform that we call SMAP, um, that is um, open source. And that incorporates all aspects um, of the work analysis workflow from localization to process processing, rendering of the images, most importantly, to then the analysis of such super resolution data um, to get some biological insights. And for, for this, we have developed more than 200 different plugins for all different kinds of applications. So one of these plugins is, a, um, is an approach 
that can fit a parameterized model directly to the uh, raw data of super resolution microscopy. And these are the coordinates of the single fluor force together with the uncertainties. So our idea is to first calculate the likelihood that this model describes the data. And then we run this through an optimizer to maximize this likelihood. And as a result, we obtain the most likely models of um, most likely parameters of this model that describe the data. In addition, we can use this approach to compare different models and um, choose the more likely one. For example, we can ask if this single nuclear pore complex is better described by an eight-fold symmetric model or a six-fold symmetric model. So this is useful because it allows us to extract quite specific and meaningful parameters from individual structures and that without any averaging. For example, here we could extract the radius and the distance between the ring for each of these nuclear pore complexes. And this will now allow us to look at something like biological heterogeneity, something that is, of course, more difficult to test if you um, rely on structural approaches that need to do some averaging to, to, uh, yeah, to get information about the structure. But we can also use this framework for something that is called single particle averaging, something that is, of course, very common in the field of electron microscopy. Um, and our, how we use it here is to, to determine the relative orientation and the relative position of many individual um, particles. And then we just average them after aligning them. As a result, we get these kind of 3D averages, again, of um, one protein in the nuclear pore complex. If uh, you now look at the upper ring and the lower ring uh, separately, you can see quite interesting features. So you see that these corners of these nuclear pore complexes are not round, they are, are elongated. They point outwards in this kind of spike-like fashion. And this directly reflects that each corner of this nuclear pore is occupied by two proteins with a slightly different radius. And I should stress again that we get this kind of resolution um, or this kind of um, averages without any assumptions whatsoever on the underlying geometry or even symmetry. We can also use this framework to integrate data from many experiments into a common um, data set. In this case, we imaged our reference protein up 96 together, always with one other protein, and then use this framework to determine the precise position and orientation of each of these NAP96 um, structures to then put all of this um, data into one, one average structure. I think such average structures that can be quite useful because they allow uh, us to kind of determine the positions of proteins that might be too small or too flexible to be visible in electron densities. So <clears throat> with this, I would like to um, yeah, go back to the, um, to the biology, again, back to the endocytosis but this time in mammalian cells. And um, we got really interested into mammalian endocytosis because of a controversy in the field. That is, how does the clathrin coat form? Um, and how does then the forming clathrin coat deform the membranes? So has, there has been the kind of um, more established model that assumed that the clathrin coat forms with a constant curvature around the growing invagination. But this model has been challenged um, then a few years back by colleagues of ours at the EMBL who showed the classroom first forms rather flat patches at the endocytic sites that then dynamically remodel to form these, uh, these vesicles. And since then, there have been really many papers uh, sub supporting either one or the other model. And this question is still far from being settled. So we thought that we could use super resolution microscopy to shed some light in this question and that we could make use of, on one hand, the high 3D resolution that we have that allowed us to quite precisely segment the clathrin code of individual endocytic sites. And this in com combination with a rather high throughput that allows us to do this for thousands of endocytic sites. And these are numbers that are yeah, still quite large um, compared to what is easily accessible in electron tomography. So we then use our model fitting approach to analyze such structures. And from this analysis, we, um, we get two important parameters. The first one is this angle theta here that describes how far does the clathrin go around the sphere. And this is an important parameter because no matter what model you believe in, um, this angle increases over time. So the part of the sphere that is covered by clathrin gets larger here and it also gets larger here. 
So this is a good um, proxy for pseudo time, and we can use it to sort our interstitial structures according to time. The other parameter is the radius of the sphere, the size of these vesicles, and that now allows us to distinguish these two models. So here I plotted the curvature, that's the inverse of the radius, versus the relative time given by this angle theta here. And you can clearly see that there is a correlation between curvature and time, and each of these dots is a single endocytic site. So clearly the constant curvature model is not compatible with our data. What we find instead is that the, um, that the endocytic sites first form rather flat, that they dynamically remodel during endocytosis, but also that during the remodeling process, they still increase their size, so they still grow. So this for us is just the beginning, because now we would like to do in for mammalian cells what we started doing for yeast cells, and that is to reconstruct the structure and dynamic, dynamics of the endocytic machinery. Here our approach is to use clathrin as a spatial and a temporal reference, and use this to an integrate many more proteins into a common coordinate system. So this is now a proof of concept data set that shows the clathrin together with a protein called dynamin, a protein that in the end assembles at the neck of the endocytic vesicle and pinches off the vesicle. And in this 3D reconstruction, you can kind of see how the protein ends up there. So this is, as I said, quite preliminary data yet, and we still have to increase um, greatly the sampling. But I think it can give you an idea where we want to go, that also here we want to add more and more proteins to such a dynamic reconstruction. Um, and to use this to better, better understand how all of these proteins work together to form this quite, um, quite complex machinery. So the last couple of minutes, I would like to tell you about a new technology that we just received at the EMBL and that I'm actually very yeah, hopeful for for the future. And this technique is MinFlux. So technically, MinFlux is quite similar to single molecule localization microscopy, because also here we need to look at single isolated fluorophores, for example, photoconvertible fluorophores that we switch on one by one. But instead of imaging these fluorophores with a camera, we now image them by scanning a donut-shaped beam around them. At each position of the beam, we detect the intensity, and then from knowing the position of the donut and from measuring these intensities, we can then triangulate the position of the flow for, and that with a much higher precision than if we had detected the, the flow for on the camera. So we were very lucky that we could collaborate with the inventors of this technique, and that's the group of Stefan Hell and um, his co-workers in Göttingen. And um, we used in collaboration their MinFlux to look at our nuclear uh, pore um, cells. And you see actually quite a beautiful um, 3D resolution here on these dual color samples. So based on this success, we could start a collaboration with a company that now is selling these MinFlux instruments, company and barrier. And about half a year ago, the EMBL and the EMBL Imaging Center obtained one of these MinFlux instruments. And since then, we have been trying to push them towards application, towards biology. This now also starts to work quite nicely. On the right hand side, you see a single nuclear pore complex that we imaged in 3D. And you, I think can really appreciate the high 3D resolution that we can measure here. But what really still blows me away is how well MinFlux works in living cells on these rather dim photoconvertible um, proteins. And this is data that we took together with the Stefan Hell group. And it's so much better than the best what we can achieve currently with live cell localization microscopy. So now we would like to push this technique to really be able to take time-lapse movies of, um, of protein structures in the living cell and it with nanometer spatial and sub-second temporal resolution. This hopefully will allow us to directly see how the clustering code forms and deforms on single, for single endocytic sites in the living cell. But MinFlex can be even a thousand times faster in a so-called tracking mode. And in this mode, the, fo uh, the donut follows an individual proof for through the cell over time. So we produce first proof of concept data by looking at the motor protein myosin 5 that walks on actin and in these um, just normal um, white field movies, you see um, that in the cell, you see quite often this progressive motion. This is now how we can image these individual motor proteins using MinFlux. And from these tracks, we of course can 
extract the steps of the of this motor protein, but we see so much more. We see how the head to domain binds to the actin that next go, searches the space till it binds again. And that read over extended time. So this track is part of a track that was about a minute long. So in the future, we would really like to extend this from one color to at least two colors, maybe three colors, because this would allow us to directly see how different domains of a protein or different proteins in a complex move with respect to each other with nanometer spatial and 10 to 100 microsecond temporal resolution. That would allow us to directly see conformational changes of these protein machines in the living cells, give us access to something like molecular dynamics. I think this could be very exciting. So with this, I'm at the end. I, yeah, I showed you a few of the projects in the lab with which I think we could extend the use of super resolution microscopy to what small and smaller scales and to something like structural questions um, in cells. And I want to end by um, thanking yeah, all the people involved in the projects I showed you today. First and foremost, my fantastic group here at the EMBL and then wonderful collaborators at EMBL and outside and generous funding. And of course, you for your attention. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, Jonas. It was a really fantastic talk. Um, lots of really impressive results. Um, I'm trying to see whether there are already questions and maybe while people uh, start to collect um, them, I have one question about sort of your mammalian endocytosis project where you sort of, I think it was really fantastic that you can distinguish two separate models that were proposed, you know, in the community. And I'm now a little bit wondering, sort of, I think you were able to rule out one. And can you sort of comment a bit more on what is the biological consequence now of this? So um, we could rule out one, we could go a small step further. So, um, and kind of really measure in a quantitative way, kind of the curvature versus the, the, the time or the angle that we measure. And we are collaborating with a physical biologist, and that's the group of Ulrich Schwarz at the Heidelberg University, who then make models for the, or kind of the molecular mechanism of endocytosis, or in their case, more kind of physical models for endocytosis that we can then fit to our data and see if these models work. We did get some quite interesting results. So one model they have, which assumes that clathrin mostly grows um, at the edge, that you have flat of, uh, a patch of clathrin and that new clathrin mostly extends the size by, by forming at the edge. That seems to work uh, quite well. But I must also say that, of course, there might be many other models that we haven't thought out of and that we didn't test that could also explain our data. So it's just that at the moment we do have models that make sense and that can explain our findings. But of course, it's more difficult than to say this is the correct model. And I think that requires more and more experiments. Good, yeah, thanks. Um, I see Jan has a question. Please, Jan. Hi, Jonas, again. Uh, so uh, I have a question about how do you decide when you can just uh, can uh, when you need a stable cell line with uh, you know uh, mm. proteins and when you can just stay with the immunostaining because as you said it's a limitation especially for normal cell yeah. line. Yeah, it's a good question. So when so often if you have a perfect antibody, then with immunostaining you get a lot of information. But we found that quite often it's very difficult to find an antibody that gives a good quality in super resolution microscopy because it needs to work so much better than what we need in diffraction limited microscopy. Because of our high resolution, we need to just decorate our structures much, uh, much more densely. Um, if we have a good antibody, then I think whatever are structural questions we can look at, but of course, with a caveat that this antibody, primary, secondary antibody is quite large and that we can have then this displacement of the fluorophore from the protein by as much as 15 nanometers. And often this is not even random, but it, it's a bias. Therefore, if we look at structures and cells on a length scale of maybe 20, 30 nanometers, and we have a good antibody, then that's the easiest to do. I would not use antibodies for something like counting because then there's, a, of course, huge, um, yeah, error or huge spread by the um, yeah by how many antibodies bind the single flu for us, especially then if you come with secondary antibodies. And also usually you cannot assume that your reference standard and your target protein have the same affinity to the antibody so that the labeling efficiency is the same. So when we do counting, we always um, suggest to to make homozygous uh, CRISPR cell lines with a convert photoconvertible protein. Thanks.
Yeah, great. Um, any other questions? There are questions you can use the raised hands or maybe just speak up and I try to identify you. Sure. Um, hi, this is Mark yeah, Zockel Mark. from Genelia. Um, so I was just wondering about your ability to also model interactions between something like the nuclear core complex and something maybe anchored to or something else within the nuclear membrane or just below it, let's say um, nuclear lamin intermediate filaments. Um, you know, that's something that not necessarily has a defined structure, but may have a spatial relationship with nuclear porins or the, the complex itself. Mm -hmm. A very good question. So in principle, with our dual color measurements, we can, of course, look at one nuclear pro protein and then one lamin protein. And I think I can say this. So we had a collaboration where we looked exactly at this. We, it was hard to really see some kind of molecular interactions there, but we could quite nicely see how different lemons were either enriched or um, or less present at the periphery of the nuclear pore complex. And these are the questions that we can address and um, that might give us some information. Although I must say that in my group, we are mostly using the nuclear pore complex as kind of a beautiful 3D structures and are not going deep into the nuclear pore biology. So this is something we like to do with our collaborators. Thank you. Um, Olivier. Amazing talk, really very cool. Um, so I was wondering for the time-lapse in the mean flux, um, if, you have, if you want to look at more than one color, so essentially two colors, how do you deal with the fact that it's sparse labeled? Because I mean, mm -hmm. essentially, let's say only 1% of the molecules would be labeled or much less, but then the probability that two co-localized would be even much like one out of, of 10,000 as an example, right? So how so, do you deal with that? Yeah, so there, there are different aspects to this. So first of all, I think we can have much higher labeling efficiencies than 1%. So we can probably go to 50% even in two colors. Um, the problem at the moment is rather that if we do dynamic images, that we don't really have flow force that we can switch on and off many, many times. So we, at the moment, we have to distribute the blinking events among the frames. And if we take 10 frames, then you're right. Then in the end, we have kind of 10% labeling efficiencies. But if you look at something like the nuclear, uh, by, by like endocytosis, we, have, we, we might have 100 of plasma molecules, then it might not be so bad. Then we can still see the relationship among the different proteins. This, um, so if you look at really large protein machines, I think uh, we, it makes sense to do it in two colors um, and we might then increase the kind of labeling by some analysis of looking at many different structures. And we also hope that people um, in the field, chemical biologists, they develop new minflux dyes that can be switched on and off many, many times. Mm -hmm. So it's something else, of course, if you look at these individual proteins, let's say where we look at molecular dynamics, where we really want to have this single protein labeled with two dyes. And this we have to do by really having very high labeling efficiencies, for example, 50% for each of them. And I think this we can do. We can either then go, yeah, not use these photoactivatable probes, but rather use proofs that stay on and bleach everything in the periphery. So to only look at one labeled, double labeled uh, uh -huh. protein machine. Okay, I see. So it's, uh, essentially, the, the question was not about the labeling efficiency, but by the fact that you have to photoactivate it. And then obviously, you have to photoactivate on the fraction of the molecules. And then um, yeah. this was a so, molecular right? But, this is true. So for, for the movies of large structures, we would photoactivate them all over the time that we're imaging. And in each movie frame, we would activate many of them. So, um, and for, for this kind of tracking mode, we would have to make, make sure that they're reactivated really at the same time. And then, of course, if we have a dense, have, have, yeah. have many of these protein machines close in the cell, if it's too dense, we have to make sure that we kind of switch off everything around our one target structure. And we have ideas of doing this, for example, using the minflux donut, which we could center around our target protein, switch, mm -hmm. use high intensities to bleach everything around and only leave this one machine in the very center of the donut switched on, something okay. along these lines. I see. So essentially, it would work for a machine which is localized, at least where the whole different components are together. Then you could essentially move, see how the machine moves. But if mm -hmm. you want to do look at um, protein or let's say our protein protein interactions, which are dynamic, then it, I guess it would not work, right? This is more complicated, of course. Yeah. Right. It probably this uh, this would be very very difficult um, to do at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, like a molecular machine where you want to label different components on the same machine, this I understand this could work. Mm -hmm. And what about threat, actually? Could you look at movements with the mean flux? 
So do you get intensity as well? Yeah, so this is very interesting. And there has been a recent paper where people implemented um, yeah, lifetime min flux. And this, of course, directly can give you threat um, signal yeah. together with the min flux resolution. So there's something I think which is super exciting and might be something worth also implementing here, or maybe even the company will implement it at some point. Very cool, very amazing, mm -hmm. thanks. Great, yeah, already lots of interesting discussions. Is there maybe one more last question before we hit the hour? Mm -hmm. No, I don't see any raised hands. So then that's perfect. We are really on time and maybe I hand back to Ulrike just quickly to wrap up the event and maybe provide a, a brief outlook to the next few speakers. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Jonas, for, for the nice presentation. So uh, our new um, talk or the, or the next talk of the series is on uh, May 4th. Uh, that will be given, that one will be given by uh, Stefan Preibisch again at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern time, uh, which is again 3 p.m. Central European time. And um, as I said, we are very much looking forward to welcoming you to the session again. This time it won't be about uh, microscopy building and the use of microscopes, but it's more about computational methods and uh, that will again be super exciting. So have a nice day and goodbye everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>